Good evening, everyone. This is D with my companion, Monster. You are listening to Creatures of Pop. Tonight, we have a very special guest, Jay Underwood, who played Johnny Storm in the original Fantastic Four movie back from 1994, the Roger Corman one. Yes, the mythical one. You can also check him out in Doom, the untold story, Roger Corman's The Fantastic Four, which will be released October 11th. I want to give a special thanks to Jay Underwood for coming on to the show tonight. Good evening, Jay. How are you doing tonight? Doing great. Doing great. Now, we did get a couple of questions from online. Uh, people who wanted to uh, double check and see, uh, get some answers to one of their questions. We did post that on the uh, Facebook page of Creatures of Fire. Oh, cool. So, um, did, did watch Doom. Uh, very informative. Uh, what was your uh, take on it when they approached you with that? Well, it's this whole this whole thing with the Fantastic Four, um, the original Fantastic Four, which we're talking about here, Roger Corman's 1990, oh, I think we did it in 92 or 93. Um, the, the movie was made for just over a million dollars. And uh, for by Roger Corman, the king of B-movies, his, his standards, that's, that's a huge budget for him. But, of course, for your average uh, Marvel kind of comic movie, that, that's nothing, you know. And so... Um, it's one of these things where had the movie actually come out, uh, I'm sure it would have, you know, it would have come out and it would have gone bye-bye by the wayside. And that's probably the last, you know, most people would have heard of it or, or it would have joined the ranks of Captain America or something like that when that first came out. And, uh, but because of the whole backstory and the fact that the movie was not released and, and people started to want to know why it wasn't released. And so, I mean, here we are some, what, almost 30 years later or something, still still, still talking about it. Not 30 years, I guess like 20, 20, close to 25 years later, still talking about it. And, uh, and so when the um, filmmakers of the documentary approached us all, uh, I think that the idea there was that uh, Mark Stice, who's the producer of Doom, uh, was uh, the casting uh, agent on the um, casting director on the Fantastic Four, and he had worked for Roger Corman for a few years. So he was the guy to kind of put it all together and say, you know what, there's been so much talk and there's been so much uh, speculation and we've had all kinds of articles written on it over the years and, and why it didn't come out. And he said, let's just finally put this one last thing together to kind of try to take all the pieces of the puzzle and see if we can get the, get the most complete picture as to what went on. And so everybody was on board for it, you know. Um, and I think as the cast, you know, um, I played Johnny Storm in Human Torch, and, uh, and, and the rest of the, the folks, we've maintained just a great relationship with one another over the years, and especially because comic conventions still call and ask us to show up, you know, for a, a special, uh, you know, Fantastic Four kind of reunion and, and whatnot. So in other words, also that's to say, the movies had a life that it would have never had, I think, had it actually come out. So we're all we're all stoked to do Doomed, and and I was really pleased with how it came out, and I think it does a good job of just kind of being the the definitive here's what happened kind of thing. And it's great that you brought up the convention circuit because with me personally, and um, I've been doing conventions for uh, yeah, I think um, we were we've been doing uh, I've been doing conventions uh, probably for fifteen twenty years now. And that movie sure. has always been the gem in every overdub bin DVD VHS. That yeah. when you find it, you're like, oh my god, there it is. And you grab it and you watch it. And it's, it, you know, amazing to watch. I mean, it was way, way beyond its time. And, you know, re looking at it and re watching the film, I, I look at it and think, this was the beginning of the Marvel Cinematic Universe that was coming out that we know of of today because it was so well done, so the story was so well done, and it was so true to the books. Right. Well, and and that's, and that's, that was, thankfully, Oli, that's on the the director, you know, he knew right off the bat that, that we're working, uh, you know, against the idea that, again, we, we, we didn't have the money that would really would have needed to, to have been put into a, a production like that. So we said, so let's just do the best we can do with what we do have control over. 
And what we have control over is the story. What we have control over is the characters, you know, and, and let's try to keep this as true to the, to the original comics as we can. And I think that, you know, one of the comments that I've gotten over the years is just that, that um, sure, you look at it and you go, you know, yeah, it's, it's low budget and uh, it's kind of schlocky at times, but, but kind of fun in the vein of, I, I, I would liken it to the, the um, Batman, color of Batman TV series, you know, pow, and zap, and, you know, just, just kind of silly and over the top at times. Um, but, but again, the, the comment that has come back is, man, you guys at least stuck to the story, you know? You at least stuck to the comic. And that kind of leads uh, into the, uh, one of the online questions. Uh, one of the online questions was uh, brought up by uh, Chris Rowe. Uh, he asked, uh, wanted to ask you, what more would you have done with Johnny Storm's character? Did you have any creative influence into it, or did you just go dive into comic books and pull what you could from the comic books? That was basically it. It was it was diving into comic books, and 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 I'll have to uh, ad- admit this. Um, at the time, I was not a huge comic book kind of guy. You know, it just it, I think the stuff that I read when I was a kid was you know Mad Magazine and Cracked and you know stuff like that. Um, so it it kind of introduced me to uh, you know com- comics in the realm of the Marvel universe and whatnot. So yeah, no, that was it. In fact, my father-in-law was a big uh, comic guy, so he started sending me you know magazines and and uh, um, uh, the Fantastic Four stuff and 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 that was kind of really my introduction to uh, to uh, to Johnny. Um, of course, there were the physical uh, characteristics, you know, things like him having blonde hair and whatnot. And so, you know, they, they took care of that easily enough and, and, um, and that sort of deal. Uh, but, yeah, no, it was, it was really just the, that was my foray into the, into, uh, the Fantastic Four universe. And I, I you know, I, I saw him as, as a guy that had a lot of energy, uh, somewhat impetuous, you know, just kind of sometimes uh, uh, act and react uh, just you know, right away, and, and uh, you know, and that was the, the thing that, again, only just kind of stressed to all of us was, you know, let's, let's not treat this like you're just, you know, some low-budget thing that's never going to see the light of day. You know, that was, <laughs> that was uh, something that we didn't, you know, anticipate. Everyone thought, yeah, this movie's coming out, and, and even while we were making the movie, we were doing interviews and, and for different magazines, and, and, uh, and starting to hit the convention convention circuit, so um, so no, that was that was what you know he kind of led the way with that. Let's let's work on the characters and just do the best we can with what we have to work with, and and we'll go from there. Now, in the beginning part, whenever you guys were doing the PR for the movie, and you guys really didn't have a sense that this movie was never going to be released, that was kind of right. underneath all the you know, bureaucracy and uh, everything sure. else that was underneath it. When you guys were doing the convention circus, uh, did you guys get a lot of the fan love? And do you think that's where some of the, you know, uh, infatuation with this movie has started? Just because you guys originally started doing conventions for this movie. Right. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's one of these things where you, there was already a built-in audience, right? There's, there's already all the comic book fans and all the, specifically the Fantastic Four fans that once word got out that this movie was being made, then people were immediately interested. And uh, uh, they started inviting, like I said, um, I'm trying to think of some of the publications. One of the big ones, I don't even know that it's still a magazine or not, was a, a magazine called Film Threat. And, uh, and they, at the time, had just gotten kind of popular and, and put us on the cover and, and sent the guy out to spend you know a few days with us on the set and all kinds of photos and interviews. and. And um, oh, there are a number of other comic and horror kind of sci-fi, you know, magazines and things that uh, that were jumping on the story. And then, like you said, the, starting to hit the convention circuit. So uh, there was a certain kind of, uh, I think, anticipation, I think hopeful excitement. Um, I think once, you know, the it was coming out that it was this lower-budget Roger Corman film, I'm not quite sure how that, you know, played into people's uh, perceptions of, of what they were going to see or what they were going to get. But at the same time, you gotta remember that that the the Marvel well, any kind of comic uh, book hero movies, they were they were not what they are now today. I think you had Batman come out, 
um, but but the whole kind of Marvel universe and whatnot was not a it was not a proven commodity um, in terms of hey we, all we have to do is take whatever Marvel character will make a big splashy movie out of it it's going to make millions and millions of dollars I, I just think that wasn't that wasn't really what was going on yet people were uh, the studios were still uh, it, it, it wasn't a sure thing in other words um, so. So that being said, there was uh, there was a lot of anticipation towards it, even though it was a low budget deal, and uh, and people were just kind of getting excited. Um, by the time we were done with the film, the film was originally to come out. It was I'm trying to remember. It was either uh, January of '93 or January of '94, and I'm just not. I think it was January '94. And, and when it was supposed to be released, and they had started to do, um, um, there was a whole kind of release schedule. Uh, it was going to open at the Mall of America, if I remember right, in Minneapolis. And, uh, oh, they had all these kind of um, charity tie-ins to Ronald McDonald House for the kids. And, and, I mean, there was a lot of hoopla that was starting to uh, that was starting to form. And then all of a sudden, just right around the time, I don't know, a few days before it was supposed to be released or whatever, a week before, uh, we started getting phone calls, and, and the cast, we all got our phone call from Oli, the director, who said the film's gone. And we're like, well, well, what do you mean gone? He said, it's shelved. It's, it's done. It's, it's not coming out. What are you talking about? He said, I don't even know. He said, that's all I know, and I, I don't know the reason why or anything else. I just understand that it's gone. And it was just, it was just like the wind got knocked out of you. Because even though it was a low-budget version because there was all the hype that was going on in the at least the comic world because the comic world at this point knew about it we thought man this could this could be a good thing for all of us you know even just career-wise in terms of kind of a stepping stone um because uh, gosh even if the movie comes out and it's you know uh, not billed as the next you know greatest thing um we all, all saw uh, the possibility that it could help all of our careers uh, including only the, the the director, so so it was just a huge disappointment. I mean, to say the least, you know, when when uh when the plug got pulled, we're all just left there twiddling our thumbs and wondering, scratching our heads, wondering what happened. And here we are, twenty plus years later. <laughs> exactly, still, still talking about still it. Still talking you about it. You know, it's funny it's, because after after that movie, I put it on my resume. You know, and and I I had a, a at that point, I had a decent resume. I was what you call, well, I, I called myself a, a blue-collar actor in Hollywood. I wasn't on the A-list, you know, um, but but I was I, I was maybe above the C-list, you know. I, I'd done a number of things that people knew of and whatnot, and so um, I was making my living doing it. But I had that on my resume, even though it didn't come out. And I'll tell you what, every, it seemed like every time I'd go into a casting session, that was the one thing that a producer or director or somebody always wanted to talk about. Oh, you were in the Fantastic Four. I heard about that. What happened? You know, and and uh, well, at least it was a fun talking point in way. <laughs> they got to open some doors. I mean, I, uh, just going over your career, you've done. Uh, you were in Uncle Buck, which is probably sure. one of John Candy's most famous movies. Uh, yeah, it was. You know, that's. You're exactly right. I think for him. John was one of those guys in, in the movie I played Bug, his uh, niece's boyfriend, kind of a low-life guy that he locked in the trunk of the car, and I get hit in the head with a golf ball from him, and, and uh, I, you, you're absolutely right. That was one that uh, that Candy really pulled off well, you know? And, you know, you, uh, you said you still have convention, uh, conventions calling you uh, still today to do that. Uh, me and Monster, right before the interview, we kind of got, you know, uh, a little bit of recollection. We did a uh, contamination in St. Louis. Uh, and, oh, years. sure. Yeah, that was. In fact, I think that was the last one that we were all at, like as a group. Mm-hmm. And uh, we, I was remembering, I was like, hey, you remember those guys that did the Fantastic Four movie? It was a like contamination. He was oh, yeah, yeah, they were cool. And it was like, well, we're going to be interviewing Jay. And he's like, oh, awesome. So it was just kind of. What's that? <laughs> I, was, I was like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> you know where blue <laughs> spandex. <laughs> um, yeah, there's one thing about the superhero movies that you know the uh, I'm glad they kind of moved away from the spandex because it's not very flattering for like large guys <laughs> or something like that. I mean, 
I might be able to pull off like a blob or something like that. <laughs> that would be me now. Right. I would not want to put on the blue spandex now, let me tell you. That would be scary. You know, it's, it's, that's what's a funny thing about that too, you know, just to show again the low budget end of things. I mean, we had a customer, and he was a great guy, you know, man, just did his best with, again, the budget that we had. But when you even look at some of the photos from, from the movie, you watch the movie itself, the costumes aren't perfect, you know? I mean, you can kind of almost tell that the numbers are sewn on and, and uh, the belts are all kind of just, you know, not at the same height and this and that. And uh, I think Rebecca Saab, uh, who played uh, my sister, the Invisible Girl, said that, uh, said, but that totally works for the movie, right? Because in reality, she's the one that made the costume, you know? She was the one that made the, the would have made the, the costumes for the for the Fantastic Four. So they would have been homemade, you know? <laughs> We're like, hey, that's good, that's good. <laughs> Which brings certain authenticity. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, like I said, uh, the one thing that I've, I've always done about it, like I said, when I watched the, uh, the, uh, the Doomed, the uh, documentary, sure. where, you know, I'm looking for words, and I'm like, what's that word I'm looking for? <laughs> but when watching the documentary, one thing that really just kind of uh, shocked and surprised me was how standoffish uh, Stan Lee has been with this movie since its inception. <laughs> <laughs> That's very disappointing, yeah. I mean, but if you go back and look at it, it truly is, if you put it up against the Marvel movies that are released, not budget-wise or you know, special effects-wise, but story-wise, it could hold its own against the newer, you know, the Marvel universe that we know today. Good, and that's, and that's cool to hear you say, you know, and, and, it's, and it is. It's, it's too bad that... Oh, Stanley especially couldn't at least give it a a little nod, you know. Um, and, and like I think it comes out in the movie Doom too. Michael Bailey Smith, you know, played play Ben Grimm, um, uh, you know, said, "Yeah, Stan was on the set. Sure, I remember meeting him uh, when when he was there one time." But I think Ben or um, Michael remembers him bringing donuts, you know, to the cast or something. And and, uh, and I I want to say too that he even made his little. Uh, his little appearance somewhere, but I don't, I, I think it ended up getting cut. I don't even know if it's in the, well, maybe it's in there. I, I have to go back and look. But, um, but yeah, you know, when, when, when the movie didn't come out and the, and the, and the pieces of the puzzle started to kind of materialize as to what happened, it just seemed like, oh man, this is the seedy side of Hollywood, you know, this is the back room, you know, deal making kind of, kind of stuff that you sometimes hear or read about, you know, in other instances, and uh, and and obviously, you know, it goes back to just it's about money, 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 and and um, and and so once uh, once the film got sold, and 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 Marvel ended up finally back with the uh, the rights and stuff. Avi Arad from Marvel has said some not very nice things about it, and uh, oh, I think he even made some comment at one point in an interview that he burned the negative or something like that, and. And at that point, too, Stan Lee just kind of jumped on board, and and um, as you see in the movie Doomed, uh, just doesn't have anything you know kind to say about it. I think I think he probably tried to avoid even talking about it in most uh, in most cases, um, you know, so that they could just kind of move on to their their big money making franchise that they that they have had uh, uh, since then. And and again, it's unfortunate because a lot of people work really hard. And, and really had good hearts towards it, you know. Um, at the time, it was, again, it was something that we all just really, really, you know, put everything we had into it and just tried to make it the best we could. And, and the, the bummer in it all is just nobody, you know, and especially Oli, the director, just ever received any, any nod or notice for it, you know. Or, or um, we thought, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if, uh, if even Marvel would, uh, would, you know, package it on one of their Fantastic Four things as like a special feature DVD or something. But instead, they just they just want to have nothing to do with it, you know? And I think that's, you know, even with today's, you know, if we can get, I mean, this is my viewpoint, and there's something I spoke to in another episode, is uh -huh. that if we have the ability to go in and, let's say, turn guns into walkie-talkies and E.T., we have the ability to go back and take the original negative of the Fantastic Four, redo all the special effects to current standards, which, to in honesty, the Fantastic Four was using special effects that were way beyond its time anyway. Sure. 
and then sure. you just redo it and then just release it as here's the original cut and here's you know the new the Lucasized version. Yeah, Lucasized version. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, I think you know if you did something like that with the movie, they could actually you know turn it into what you know what the movie should have been done to twenty plus years ago. And I should sure. probably make more money off of it releasing it out on a DVD like that. Well, I'll tell you what, they wouldn't have much to lose, would they? Because <laughs> the late, latest Fantastic Four ones haven't exactly been performing the way that they thought or hoped, huh? No. <laughs> so it's kind of like what they thought was, was going to hurt their franchise. I, I, I would agree with you. I think it could actually be a bonus to them, you know? Or a help, or just create a, uh, just some, a, you know, maybe a little new light for us. Uh, for the Fantastic Four. I, know. I surely don't think it would do anything to hurt anything, you know, <laughs> in, in terms of the Fantastic Four franchise, right? I mean, right. come on, you know? <laughs> uh, that's just ridiculous to even say. Well, you know, in this case, Disney's listening, you know, release it for a year or two, then vault it. Save it for a 10 right. years. Do you like you do all your animation yeah. and then bring it back out again and just, you know, keep throwing the, you know, keep casting that, you know, fishing hook out there, you know, keep, yeah. Because, like I said, it was, it's, you know, I knew about the movie because of the convention circuits and getting food sure. and copies and right. people handed yeah. it to me. And it's like, hey, this movie, you'll never find it anywhere. And that was always the the big mystery to it. You'll never find yeah. it right. anywhere. And when you found it, you were like the holy grail, you know. You didn't know whether to drink, yeah. you didn't know whether to drink from it or, you know, put it up on the mantle or something. <laughs> It was truly, it was like, wow, I got it. So, and uh, I just don't understand, you know, that's where my concept is. Because I'm, myself, I'm, I'm a film buff. I'm, I love watching movies, sure. you know. And to me, that's part of history. That's part of, you yeah. know, how everything got drilled. I mean, if we can, there if, you go. If we can stomach Dolph Lundgren as the Punisher, <laughs> <laughs> I think we can do just about damn near anything. <laughs> exactly. I, I I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it was funny. You know, mentioned too, just like the bootleg. That's one of the questions I think that comes up in Zoom, if I remember right, with uh, Oli, uh, which is uh, well, so how did you know the bootleg version kind of uh, kind of get out there? And uh, and and everybody has kind of a little theory and stuff. I think I don't know if Oli says it in the movie or or what, but um. But he had at one point his own copy, which you know wasn't uh, uh, didn't have all the finishing uh, uh, post production touches on it. And he said, and I think I he went down to a copy place, you know, and just had him make some copies because he wanted each of the cast members to at least have one. He thought that everybody had 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 earned at least you know uh, having their own copy. And he says. I, I picture like the guy that you know, 2 a.m. is doing the copies, you know, at the video facility, looking at the footage, going, "Oh my gosh, this is the Fantastic Four movie!" You know, <laughs> making all these copies and send them out across the country, kind of thing. Well, we can actually probably get you know, back. I can say Fantastic Four was probably the start of the bootleg era. Yeah, pretty much. So it started what? It started the uh, bootleg uh, piracy. Oh period. yeah, sure, it really kicked. Takes it off big time, huh? <laughs> you know, I remember. Yeah, well, and of course, now with YouTube and stuff, Cash, you don't even have to, you know, buy a bootleg copy. I think you can pretty much see the whole movie, you know? Yeah. From just uh, watching stuff on YouTube. Yeah, the first time I saw it, uh, I saw the, the trailer at a convention in 1995. Oh, okay, and, sure. And I stood there watching it, and I was like, what the hell is this? And I'm yeah. like, oh, wait a minute, that's the thing. I had a big, I, I loved the thing back then because he's yeah. a large guy like me and covered in rocks. <laughs> so I, I flipped out and, the guy, and I was asked the guy behind the counter, I was like, what is this? Because it was just on a, on a little TV that they plugged in <clears throat> with a VCR and I guess they just looped the, the trailer. And you guys discussed this sure. in, in Doom. It was just a, a looping trailer. And uh, the guy handed me a copy of the bootleg, and I was like, well, what is this? And he's like, it's five bucks. And I was like, I didn't ask how much it is, but what is it? Huh. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it was amazing. I, I didn't buy the copy because back then I was afraid. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, they've come down in price now, you know? Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, it was it was pretty pretty amazing getting to see that as it came out. Sure. And, and I really wish. Yeah, that that's the thing. Movie. They had the trailer. They were using it, and it was playing before other movies. You know, it's funny two months ago you mentioned the the thing, and that was actually probably one of the one of the the classiest uh, components of of our special effects for in terms of the money that we did have to work with. Man, the guys that that they had come up with the thing costume, they really did a great job. Oh, I mean, brilliant. again, for, for the budget, they, they did the full, you know, mask with servos and things in it to make, you know, eyelids and mouth move. And, and uh, the funny thing with that was it was the, the thing costume was made well in advance of the movie uh, getting made because we had such a limited time and it had to be done by uh, a certain date, which all played into the reason why, you know, it, it, it didn't come out and it was to satisfy contracts and this and that and the other and um, so they had built the thing costume to a certain size. But then when they cast Michael Bailey Smith as Ben Grimm, he's a huge bodybuilder guy. Mm-hmm. And there was no way he was getting in that suit, you know. So then they had to, they, they um, had a, a Carl Giafaglio who uh, um, played the thing in the costume because it was made to his, his body size. So, but yeah, that, that was kind of one of the cooler components of the effects. Yeah, I, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Then Ninja Turtles came out. Around roughly oh, sure. the same time, yeah. and it had the same technology, but it had Jim Henson's right. name on it. But I was like, "Well, this is the exact same thing." Pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of a curiosity. Do you know if that the thing uh, costume still exists? I, I I believe it does. I think. Um, oh, I'm trying to think who. You know, I, I'm pretty sure it does, and I and I think the pieces are all uh, with with some of the key players. Like um, Oli m- might have something, or it's possible that uh, Michael Bailey uh, does, or um, or even Mark Sykes, the producer of Dune. But I think most of that stuff. Um, I think when when um, when uh, well, gosh, I don't know if it would have been at the end of our filming it, or if once they knew that it wasn't going anywhere. Uh, you know, people had kind of rounded some of that stuff up, so it, it's in it's in good hands. It's not in the uh, obvious hands, and, and you know, ending up on some uh, trash dumpster. Or as he would say, you know, that he burned it too with the negative, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's yeah. When he, whenever I heard that, he like he burned the negative. I'm like, yeah, that's just that's just, that's just ultimately rude to say that you just destroyed a target yeah. on your negative, especially you know. You know, in the day and time, you know, whenever we're finding, you know, 35 millimeter, you know, prints of King Kong in a wall in Britain. That has right. scenes that's never been seen before, and everybody just walks exactly. to it. I mean, you know, we're kind of like... More, more more footage of the JFK assassination or something, right, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I hate to think of, you know, the, you know, the 35 millimeter print is kind of like... Uh, the Ark and the Covenant, where you have know, Indiana Jones movies that are sitting in a warehouse right. somewhere, right. in a box, just sitting, waiting for sure. someone to discover it. Yeah. yeah, I, you know, and I, I doubt that he, you know, literally destroyed it. I mean, that would be just a pathetic thing to do, you know. So I, my guess is just what you said. It's sitting in some vault somewhere, you know. Marvel's got it somewhere. He probably uh, screams it for his friends at his multi million dollar mansion. Can I hear you guys watch this? This is where I screwed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my cameo. Here's where I come in. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, as far as, you know, Dune goes, I mean, uh, Whenever you, when all the actors got together for this, what, what, what were your guys' hope for this uh, documentary? You know, I don't know that anyone really had any. <laughs> I'm sure the filmmakers had hopes for it, you know, in terms of it actually coming out. And and uh, I I think it was really, I think it was, it was made, because again, we've been, ta- we've been talking about this for 20 plus years. So, so in, in, in one sense, it, it wasn't something uh, uh, new for us in terms of trying to kind of figure things out. It was really the filmmakers then, you know, taking all the components, the different, you know, interviews and, and pieces of the puzzle and trying to lay them all out on a table here and, and fit them all together as, as best they could. So uh, to that end, I really think what was behind it was, 
hey, there's a lot of people that worked really hard on this that never got any credit for it, basically, you know? And, and it's, it's, almost, um, it's almost in honor of, of, of all of them, you know, that, that uh, played a part in this um, from the, you know, all of us as the actors and Noli the director to, uh, to the guys that did all the, the um, uh, special effects stuff and the guys who did the music and sound things and, the, you know, all the people that, uh, that, that played a part in it. And I think more than anything, that was what it was about for the filmmakers. Just hey, you know, let's 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 give some credit where credit is due, and and uh, because it was just a, a, a shame that you know it, it never really saw much of the light of day anyway. And uh, I think that was I think that was what was behind it. So you know, which is kind of cool because we all had our, our our hearts in the making of the Fantastic Four, and I think the filmmakers really had their hearts in making in making Doom. And uh, so, you know, sure, it'd be great to have a theme and, 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 and get it out there and, and uh, have people, you know, just kind of kind of know what happened. And, you know, whether or not that's going to lead to, you know, Marvel ever doing anything with, uh, with our original one, I, who knows? Who knows? I mean, if something like that ever happened, I guess it would just kind of be the icing on the cake. Well, I, for one, have signed a petition that's online. I think there's multiple. Uh, oh, cool. Petition to get it finally released. Yeah, that would and that would be great. You know, I mean, sure, that would, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. I know. But with, you know, again, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I know with us, uh, Creatures of Pop, we did put on an online petition. Uh, oh, great. To have people sign it uh, to go to the studio to show that there is still a calling for this movie that it should be released, if not. For you know, not just for monetary sake, but for everybody that put time and effort and love and care in this movie, you know the people yeah. that were working on it after hours and even after the project was done and over with, the 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 gentlemen and the guys and gals that were doing the post production work, even though there was right. no money coming in for this movie, right? They were still there yep. trying to finish it. <laughs> yep, exactly, exactly. I think only tells that story in in, in Doomed of already working on another project but uh but you know in the in the wee hours you know still still trying to you know get what he could done on uh on fantastic four yeah <laughs> and, 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 yeah exactly yeah and, you know like you said that would be kind of the icing on the cake but everybody was really pleased that 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 doom got made and 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 marty uh, langford the director and again mark Sykes, the producer they they just did a great job you know and they had to corral everybody together I think most of the cast still lives in Los Angeles. I'm kind of the the uh, the loner. I'm up in the uh, in the northwest corner of California. So they were kind enough to fly me down there to you know spend a day just doing the interviews and and whatnot. And, and they're trying to gather up stuff from the cast. Okay, do you guys have your call sheets? Do you have photos? Do you have video stuff that you took? You know, just whatever they could to to uh, to to put into it and 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 get information. You know, try to. Again, just get all the uh, all the pieces, <laughs> as many pieces of the puzzle as they could, anyway. Now, do you still have your suit? No, that 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 I, that I don't know. I don't know where the spandex stuff ended up. Um, in fact, at the time, usually I'm really good about you know kind of rounding up a, a prop or two, you know, from from you know all the different movies and things that that I would work on, and um, I got a nice kind of little assortment of just stuff. But for whatever reason, that was one that that um that I didn't I didn't really kind of snag anything from you know and I think the most that I have is my script and uh, I think I might have had all the actors sign the script at some point you know um, but yeah I, I, don't, I don't have any of my stuff. Right <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I even I even got this was a this was a good score I'll tell you guys. I even got, I did an episode one time of um, Star Trek Voyager and uh, with, with Janeway, and, 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 and so I was a crew member. So I had my little communicator, you know, my uniform. And, uh, you know, you're wondering what it's going to look like when you're, you know, there on the set. You know, it's going to be this cool communicator, metal, you know, whatever, you know, polish this and that. And what. No, it's just this hunk of plastic that Velcro's onto your uniform, you know? It's like nothing. I didn't but, yeah, know that. <laughs> what's that? I didn't know that. 
Yeah, yeah, it's like nothing. My mom, she loves Star Trek, and so she got like this communicator you can buy off like QVC, you know? And it's like nice and metal and it's heavy and it's all, you know, it's like she probably paid $100 for the thing. But this is like this hunk of plastic, Velcro's on. And, and when you're working on the Star Trek show, they all know, all the prop guys know that, man, everybody's going to be trying to snag, you know, whatever they can get. And so, I mean, they would give me my, my little pad that I would be using, you know, like right before they roll camera. And the minute they said cut, the prop guys are like, okay, I'm going to take that. Thank you very much. And uh, because they know that stuff would, would disappear and end up on eBay and whatnot. And at the end of it, I remember asking the wardrobe guy, uh, who I'd kind of become just friends with, and, and I said, I don't suppose I could keep my communicator. And he says, ooh, no, I'm not supposed to let you have it. But if I was to happen to walk into your trailer when you left at the very end and the communicator wasn't there with the costume, I would just assume it got lost somewhere. I said, oh, thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so I got my little communicator. So. <laughs> In yeah. fact, I told my, when my son went away to college last year, you know, we're putting together his financial aid, which just about kills you, you know, just is staggering, you know, like the cost of college. It turns out the finance guy at his college is a huge Star Trek fan. And I said, well, listen, if you help me, maybe I'll help you and you'll find my little communicator in the mail one day. Oh, <laughs> what nice. do you think that's worth, the full ride? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Especially if somebody's watching that thing, your screen, these props are going big well, dollars they're, they're about <laughs> yeah. I'm sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just one of those, you know, crazy things, I mean, but, you know, I think, uh, just uh, one final question for you, and uh, sure. I do appreciate your time for today. Uh, no, it's good, good talking about it. <laughs> now, on Doom, with the, with the documentary that's been released, do you think yeah. uh, that everybody kind of got an air of closure whenever they did this film, that they were able to say what they needed to say? To who they needed to say it to. I sure. I, I think. I think. And and maybe maybe even for some of the other guys that worked on it, like we were saying earlier, some of the special effects guys and the music guys and the post production guys and and whatnot. Because for all of us as cast, like I said, we've been talking about it for 25 years, you know. And 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 I don't know that over that course of time that anything new has, you know, of of great significance has has come out or come to light. Really what it was, again, for the filmmakers was just was taking all of the pieces of the puzzle, all of the different magazine articles or, or things that, 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 um, that they were able to gather in terms of information and, and what happened and just kind of, you know, assembling the final, the, 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 the final picture. Um, so I think for all of us, it was hugely entertaining. I think it was, it was, it was great to watch it the first time and, and just hear the other cast members and what their recollections were, because not all of our interviews were uh, were done at the same time. And so, you know, though we had talked about a lot of this stuff, um, um, it was uh, it was the type of thing where uh, where it was it was fun to hear and just kind of go, oh yeah, that's right, and oh gosh, I maybe I hadn't heard that one before, but uh, but yeah, you know, as, as the as the closure, sure. I, I mean, I I anticipate still talking about it. You know, I'm I'm sure. You know, who knows how much more life this thing's gonna have. I mean, if Marvel ever decided to do anything, anything with the uh, with the original production, then maybe they would, uh, you know, come out and and we'd hit the uh, we'd hit the we'd hit the circuit all over again. You know, who knows? Again, we want to give a special thanks to Jay Underwood for coming on to the show. You can definitely check him out in the new doc documentary, Doom, the Untold Story of Roger Corman's Fantastic Four, released on digital October 11th. Definitely uh, swing by the Facebook page and also also swing by creaturesofpop.com. Click on music and give a little bit of love to Machine in the Mountain for their song Wake, which you heard at the beginning, and you'll also hear at the end of this show. Until next time, this is Dee uh, speaking for Monster, and you have a great night.